Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very, very, very special guest today. We have Roger Connect, and he is an amazing business coach, and today he's going to help you learn how to grow your business. He has such great strategies and tools that he's going to go over, and he's going to show you the easy little steps that you can incorporate into your daily business that could help you grow and expand and get to the levels that you want to get to. So Roger, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, Stacy, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate being here. I happen to be a husband, father, president of Universal Accounting Center. I actually work with owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. We train them as they're growing their business as well as their staff. And then we have a division of our company called the Universal Business Builders Department. And that's where we work as business coaches with clients that range in a variety of industries, just helping them as business owners build their companies. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, so many people go through life and they're business owners and they're very stressed out because, you know, ever since COVID hit, especially, you know, it's been really hard for a lot of people to play catch up. And a lot of people just want to grow. They want to expand or, you know, sometimes it, you know, for some people, it's time for a change. You know, it, it all depends where you're at and, you know, what your business is looking like. And, you know, people sometimes need a little guidance. And, you know, for people who are trying to grow their business or they're trying to enhance what they have right now, you know, what are some uh, things that you'd like to maybe share? And you mentioned some principles and some things that you teach your your clients and it works really well for people who are trying to improve their business and grow. So why don't you share some of those things with us? Because I'd love to hear them. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, yeah, the principles that we teach are proprietary. They're ones that we've identified after becoming an Inc. 500 uh, company 5,000 numerous times. What we've realized is there's a secret in the sauce, and we wanted to figure out what it was for ourselves, what, what really <laughs> was working. And we identified something that's turnkey, it's duplicatable, and we've been sharing it for now a number of years. And it begins with what's called the universal business model. And within that, there happen to be nine principles that make a business profitable. And the first is nothing happens until you make a sale. I think a lot of times as business owners, we get excited about the product or service that we offer. We get really excited about developing it, working within it. We kind of find that as our hobby, our interest, but in the reality of things, we have to now focus on the marketing and sales that bring in the revenue to be able to then provide that product or service to someone that will appreciate it. And so rather than going back to the office and uh, working on things that are internal, we need to get out, figure out what we can do to market and sell these services and basically make it a priority that nothing happens until we really make that first sale. You know, that's that's one of the, a great point because I see with a lot of people who have businesses, they focus so much on the product and they're not really focusing so much on the sale of the product. Now, you know, how, you know, how, what do I need to do to sell this product? If, and once I do sell this product, how do I continue this ongoing revenue so it doesn't stop? And how can I upscale? You know, and people sometimes get so wrapped up with the initial product that they're forgetting about the whole point of why they created this product in the first place. And then all that time and energy is going into that product and they're not making the sales or they're just making enough to get by. And then at the end of the month or at the end of the week, Week, they're looking at their sales and they're very frustrated. Why is it so low? You know, why am I working so hard? And I haven't gotten to that point where I want to be, you know, and, you know, I see that with a lot of people. Yeah, it's sometimes referred to as the feast and famine scenario. You <laughs> feast for a while because you made some sales, you're excited about what you're doing, but because you've now taken your eye off of the marketing and selling, you're now going to go through this famine stage. And it's where you've got to reprime the pump. I don't know if anyone's old enough to remember that analogy, but you got to get that really going again. And that cycle takes time and energy, but if you kept it going all the time, giving attention to the marketing and sales throughout the week, the month, all of a sudden you'll find that those dry spells aren't as frequent because you have this constant flow of new customers. And so there is this em emphasis on marketing and selling. I, I get you love what you do, but you've got to be able to market and sell it. Now, that being said, a lot of people are very good at either the marketing or the sales, but sometimes it's rare that they're great at both. And so yeah. you've got to identify which of it, which of the two are you good at. And then once you've identified, okay, I'm great at selling, but I've got to figure out marketing. That's when you can really put some good effort into figuring out what are some tried and proven methodologies that you can rely upon. And that's something that we focus on, which we refer to as the 
the rule of thumb. You've got to have four proven marketing methods and one BIF that you're testing all the time. So just some thoughts on that. And what are some of those those marketing methods that you could share with us and maybe you know, help people understand? Well, it varies industry to industry. You know, some are very big into networking. Others might be in advertising. So it does vary industry to industry, especially if you're a B2C or a B2B type company. So mm -hmm. the four do vary. But the question I always ask my clients is, what are your primary sources of marketing? Where do you find your ideal client? What is it that you're doing to get their attention so that they're willing to self-identify and allow you to then nurture them and sell them? And so these four things, they vary industry to industry, business to business, but I always want to have four because ultimately one of those four is either going to no longer be profitable or it's no longer going to be effective. And so I've right. got to be marketing and testing something to replace those. In my own business, we've been around since 1979. I've been the president now for more than 10 years of the company. Wow. The company doesn't look anything like it did when I started back 25 years ago with the company. Yeah. We were doing marketing that no longer even exists. I remember yeah. doing things in, uh, let's say, newspaper advertising. I haven't advertised in a newspaper for probably close to 10 <laughs> years now, but that was the key place where people found their information. And so that was something that was very effective for us. But if I hadn't found that fifth thing to replace the newspapers, I would be in a world of hurt, if not basically out of business. And so right. I've got to realize that from a marketing point of view, I've always got to be on the lookout for what is a new strategy that can complement what's happening because funnel marketing today in the, in the internet, that's something that's fairly new. It's probably less than 10 years old. So right. you've got to be willing to adapt. I've seen that a lot with people. Like we br briefly touched base before the um, the actual podcast, and and I had mentioned that you know I've seen so many people they get stuck in their old marketing ways, and they're still doing the same strategies, and they're not realizing they're saying why isn't this working? Why is, am I not bringing in the income? I you know why am I having problems with X, Y, and Z? But they're still they're still marketing like they were ten years ago, and you know I believe it isn't it every couple of years you freshen up your brand you should try mm -hmm. to start to change things around you know because it, it really you know it gives a new fresh look it gives it makes people excited and it makes people want to be more i guess you know they they look at your website and they, oh it looks new maybe they have something new you know and, and they start to you know dig around and look and see and you know and even you could have the same product and you could just rephrase it and reword it or do something different and it looks like a whole brand new product when it's actually the same product, but it's just marketed a different way. Exactly. Yeah. Branding becomes a very big part of this marketing scheme because uh, you're really in a position of trying to, through your image, portray who it is that you're trying to appeal to. So all of a sudden, branding becomes an issue that relates to the marketing. So uh, there's a lot of variables or factors, but to the point of needing to change I'm right now dealing with the Google AI that's hap that's uh, changing the Google AdWords platform. Yeah. I'm working right now with uh, challenges that I'm facing as it relates to Facebook and Instagram advertising as that platform changes. Yeah, nothing's status or st um, nothing's uh, uh, evergreen. There's always yeah. this dynamic change, and I need to be willing as a business owner to notice those trends changing and adapt. Adapting is the key. If you can change, that's phenomenal. You're going to stay ahead of the curve. Now, I know you have some other strategies also. Can you share with us some of the other things you were talking about previously that you feel help really have a business, helps businesses grow in their in their um, journey? You bet. One of the things that's very important once we've ad addressed the items found in the universal business model is we, then we start talking about numbers. Numbers are very essential in business. It's really uh, how we understand what's happening is watching the leading and lagging indicators that mm -hmm. are key metrics in our company. And when I work with the business clients, I'm always interested in knowing what, first of all, do they watch? What are the numbers they're interested in? And then we try to identify some additional ones that they can be using to run their company. At the end of the day, and you've heard this phrase perhaps before, accounting is the language of business. And so all these metric and numbers, they feed into ultimately the financial reports. And so it's very important that you in the end, as a business owner, trust or become familiar with your business numbers, your financial reports. And for that reason, I talk about what's called the three core accounting services that every business owner should expect from the accounting profession. Mm -hmm. They should all anticipate and use bookkeeping and accounting to get the financial numbers they need 
to make intelligent business decisions. Right. You should be working with a tax planner and advisor to actually make sure that you're getting your fi your taxes filed in a timely manner, accurately, but more importantly, leveraging tax strategies to mitigate legally your tax liability. And then lastly, it's CFO and advisory services. Within the accounting profession, there are CFO and advisory services to help businesses with cash flow needs, yes. helping them get the funding, the capital needed to run the business. These things are essential, but too often I think business owners are unaware of what the accounting profession can offer to them. Yeah. And so they're kind of standoffish running the business perhaps even by their wisdom or gut, well, I would actually suggest there's numbers there that we should be watching. And the better you can trust the numbers, the more non-emotional the, non the whole experience of running the company becomes. Do you think there's specific things they should keep their eye open? Because I don't think a lot of people actually, there are there are really good business owners that focus on the numbers and they focus on the accountant, but that you have a lot of businesses that don't. And what are some things that they really need to focus on? Well, before I answer that question, I'm going to give you a story. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a regular story I experience as a business coach. I go in, start meeting with the client, and at, at the face, they seem to be doing well. You know, on the surface, they're they're fine. Uh, you could meet them in a networking meeting in a social setting, and they seem to be doing all right. They're driving the nice car. They're wearing the nice clothes. They're they're positive and optimistic. You get them back in the room, and after a few meetings, and they become a little bit more comfortable with me, all of a sudden, they'll start to become a little bit more open. I've provided for them a safe environment where they can be transparent, and they start to reveal they've got cash flow issues. They've got, mon they've got uh, revenue concerns. They've got growth concerns. Well, these concerns all stem back to numbers, and too often, they're just not watching the numbers. They're not using their money wisely. And uh, what I try to do is help them realize what we can do is get ahead of this. Case in point, I'm right now working with one of my clients, and we're making some major changes within the business model, and I'm stressing to them the importance of the accrual accounting model versus the cash accounting model. Mm -hmm. The cash accounting model is to say whether or not you've got the money you need in the bank to pay the bills, to make payroll. Right. But the accrual is so vital to show whether or not the business model is working. From an accrual point of view, if the business is profitable there, we can then work on the cash flow and address those concerns in it. But the accrual business model is very essential. But for some business owners, it's confusing to them why the accrual says I'm profitable, but there's no money in the bank. Well, yeah. there's a purpose for that. And uh, when you go through as a coach and educate your business clients as to what the differences are, those three core accounting services that they can expect from the accounting profession, they can be game changers to the success of the company. Oh, I agree. Totally. I, you know, a lot of people when it comes to accounting, you know, you know, you hear people say, oh, use this software, use that software. But most of the time, you know, uh, most people don't know how to properly do their account accounting and they don't know what to look for. And sometimes they get the numbers, but they don't really know what the numbers mean, you know. And like you said, a lot of things are overlooked and then they're, they're wondering why things aren't flowing the way it is or why they're not at the point where they anticipated. Maybe they made a trajectory and they they by this month, you know, of the year, I'm supposed to be here because, you know, it looks like I'm doing X, Y, and Z each month. So I should be here and they're not, and they don't even know what the missing component is when, if they do the proper accounting and they, ha they work with a professional that knows how to do the proper accounting, they could actually figure out what's missing, what's not missing and what needs to be implemented or changed. You're right. In my book, uh, I address these three cores and I point out that Oftentimes, the business owner struggles to understand what the difference between a bookkeeper is and their role mm -hmm. and an accountant and their right. role, the difference between a tax preparer and a tax advisor. And the reason why I bring this up is because too often the book, the uh, uh, business owner struggles to manage or interact with these individuals because they don't know what they can expect for them. They don't know what they're paying for. Right. But to your point, the numbers, they are essential to the success of the business. It's how the business communicates. It's, yeah. it's the role of the accountant to be that translator or interpreter of the numbers, the financial report to say, hey, by the way, the, the business is trying to tell you that it likes this, do more of this. There's a good ROI on this advertising. Oh, by the way, the business doesn't like this. It's costing and it's ruining the, the uh, let's say the cogs are affecting the, the profit margin. All of a sudden, this communication that the accountant is able to say as it translates the financial reports for the business owner helps the business owner make more informed business decisions. In my opinion, it makes the business a lot more fun. It's interactive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree totally. 
Now, when, when it comes to your book, like what are some key components that you want to share that might be surprising to people? Because a lot of times people, you know, you know, like you said, they're good in one area, but they mm -hmm. might slack in other areas. But are there some key components that people should realize in order to like have a, a business that's going to be profitable? Yes. So in the book, what I did is I basically started with the understanding that business owners are great at what they do. They're phenomenal in the industry they're in, the product or service they're offering, but too often they just don't focus enough on the numbers. And admittedly, it's because they don't know where to begin, nor yeah. do they know what to ask. And rather than being embarrassed, they sometimes just avoid the questions. Right. And so I begin the book by pointing out that it's important to understand the roles that exist in accounting as it relates to the, to the business. And I define what is a bookkeeper? And when you pay for those services, what should you expect from a bookkeeper? Yeah. What is an accountant? And when you pay for an accounting service, what is the accountant supposed to be doing for you? Right. Well, as I go through that evolution, both personally, as I've spoken to these business owners and professionally servicing them, there's some epiphanies that come out of this experience that really help the business now become much more successful because they're no longer uh, running it blindly. Yeah. They're not just winging it. They're actually in a position where they're running it based on the numbers and the numbers validate what they're experiencing. So their confidence, the business owner's confidence goes up tremendously when they're able to say, I'm validated by what it is I'm experiencing based on the financial reports that are being produced. It's not take the numbers and file them. It's literally take the numbers and use them to see, okay, does this illustrate what I'm experiencing? And uh, it's phenomenal. So yeah, in the book, I talk about these three core accounting services, but then I kind of evolve into what I refer to as becoming a great leader. You need to really identify your passion as a business owner and yes. really tap into your why you're in, company, uh, in the company. I really feel that a lot of business owners, as they struggle, as they run into hard times, the more clear it is as to why they're doing their business, the yes. more likely it is they're going to push through and come out the other side successful. And uh, I talk a lot about passion, the, the mm -hmm. idea that the passion that the business owner brings is contagious. It's what draws in the employees, helps them yes. be loyal to the business. It helps them draw in the customers. The customers want to work with you because you're clearly mm -hmm. passionate about what you do. And right. so I talk about what do you do to gain that energy, that excitement that's contagious? And yeah. what do you do to retain it? It's important that you maintain that passion because it can wane over time after you get beaten down a few times. So yeah. how do you retain it? So I, I spent a little bit of time talking about that as well. I think that's an excellent topic to talk about because, you know, one thing is if you're in in, in a specific area and you went in there, you know, with thinking that this was your passion and then as time went on and it, it no longer has become your passion. It's, so it's like you said, it windles on you. It kind of draws you down. You're getting drained. And is this is not really where you feel like you should be at. Sometimes we get those pivoted moments where the light bulb goes off and say, I don't know if this is, you know, I'm ready for a change. This is not what I want to do. But if you do have that passion, I say, if you feel like that, then it's time to really think about maybe constructively making another decision to move on into another, you know, um, business that's going to make you happy and bring you that passion that you were talking about. But for people who, ha you know, have that passion and they've be been be beaten down, because when you have that passion, you want to get up in the morning, you feel fired, you want your business to succeed. And, you know, it's something that, that drives you, makes you happy, you know, but when you do get, you know, knocked down a few times, it, it, it really can, you know, it starts to really, you know, damper, you know, the whole momentum, the, the passion. And, and it, sometimes it is hard to retain it because you feel like sometimes people feel like they've gotten they've moved fat, forward two steps and they've gotten knocked back three steps you know and it's like how many times can you get knocked you know knocked down you know some people can keep getting up but not everybody's like that you know and for those people who keep getting knocked down you know what's your suggestion to them you know because there are a lot of people like that well, there's a few suggestions. Uh, one, I'm going to say personally, you've got to actually find your why. You've got to identify why are you going through this? Because at the end of the day, everyone's looking at you and they're wondering, are you going to move forward? Are you going to act? Or are you going to give up? And so yeah. you've got to identify, okay, where am I going? And the analogy I would use is you've just got to basically have this idea of I'm in a fight and I need to push through this, but where am I headed? Where's the ultimate de uh, destination? Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm ever going to arrive. It's the journey that I need to enjoy. But sometimes you get a flat tire. Sometimes you mm -hmm. run out of gas. Sometimes you get lost. And yeah. the point is, is what are you willing to do to get back on the right track? And people are in the car with you yeah. and people are 
following you mm -hmm. and they're wondering, okay, what are we going to do here? We're willing to pull over and help you with the car, the tire. We're willing yeah. to pull over and help you get gas. We're willing to actually go off the side roads and go on a little uh, dis uh, diversion. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're following you. So tell us what's going to happen here. And as long as you realize people trust you, people are looking to you as the expert, as the authority, yeah. then all of a sudden it gives you a little bit more confidence to say, you know what? I can make this, I can do this. Right. And some people thrive off of that, just realizing, yes. you know what? I like the fact that people care what I have to say. Yeah. And as a leader, that's very important, especially when you're running an organization, a business. And so that's very helpful. So some other helpful hints, hints by the way, is professionally, I encourage you to join an association, an organization of peers. Most industries have associations, conferences that you can attend. And I encourage you to not only just attend, but participate, get involved. And the reason why is because you're around other individuals that are doing similar to you and you're able to see how they're succeeding. And oftentimes there's going to be somebody better than you that you're going to be able to learn from and be inspired by. Right. There's also people at those conferences that are following behind you. They're starting out and they're, they're able to see you as that mentor. Well, yeah. look at what they're doing. I want to follow them. And so you're in the middle of this pack and it's important because you're able to look forward and see others that are inspiring you. And you can look behind you and see others that are being inspired by you. And so that's very important. The other thing I would add is read books. If you read five books, Mm -hmm. on a given topic, any given topic, if you write, read five books on it, you are arguably more the authority than 97% of the people out there. You know more about the topic. You know the pros and cons of the, of the discussion. You can argue both sides and you can make an intelligent reason as to why your way, your product, your system, your service is better than the alternative. And right. if you can articulate that well, then all of a sudden you're seen as the authority in the space, in that industry, in that profession. And that's what you want to do. You want to be passionate about what you do for a living. And so read the books, stay attuned to what's going on, join the associations, participate in the conferences. And by doing so, you'll stay engaged and you'll want to keep going because it's very, very contagious. Oh, I agree. Totally. I, I, and I, I really encourage that too. I, I think it's great when people start to read and they start to look at, you know, cause each leader, you know, that has succeeded in our, in our society, you know, has a different point of view of how to do things. They might have some similarities, but then they also have some differences of how they approach things. And it gives you ideas of, you know, how something might work for you from one person and then something might another another thing might work for, from another person and you can kind of pull from each individual or each book that you're reading and kind of come up with your own regimen that might be beneficial for your own overall business and i do like the fact that you also mentioned that you know when you are the leader and you are the either the owner or the manager you really have to try to you put on a good positive attitude as best as you can and really have good communication skills with your workers and treat them with respect because it it's shows it and it also the the you know the outcome is different you know when people when people feel appreciated and they're communicated well and they, they feel valued they 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 work harder they try differently they they do things that they normally probably wouldn't do you know and it all has to do with how we talk but sometimes people can get frustrated with their business and sometimes that frustration goes out to their their workers not purposely but it's just you know some people handle stress better than others. And I've seen both, right. both sides of the, of the, of the, the walkway. And, you know, I've seen people that, you know, even though they've gotten knocked down, they hold their composure and they're, they're pretty good. And, and they, they still have that positive get go and they're feeding their client their I mean, their employees with that positiveness. And then you have some that are getting frustrated and that frustration shows because when they're talking all of a sudden you could see the body language or the facial expressions, and you could see that there's something wrong and that rubs off on people, the energies, you know, and people have to realize that it, it plays an important part. No matter what you're going through, you have to do your best to try to, to really keep, I think, your employees positive and keep them, you know, feel like they're valued and respected. I appreciate you saying that because when I work with my clients, I define them as what I call the energizer bunny. Everyone's yeah. <laughs> drawing their energy from them. And yeah. so your point about the employees looking to the leader to see what's going on and how they should be feeling is absolutely correct. I help my clients realize that when they walk in the office and they're able to walk in, say hello, be smiley, uh, be you know upbeat and positive, everyone in the office feeds off of that. And they're like, okay, the business is doing good. Life's good. I can be comfortable here. I yeah. don't need to look for another job. I'm, you know, everybody's happy. 
But you walk in that building and you're a little bit more distant. You're not, uh, you know, you're not meeting people or seeing people. You're going straight to your office and you're shutting the door. People are like, okay, something's off. Something's wrong. Should yeah. I start getting worried about this? Should I look for another job? All of a sudden, you have to understand you're setting the temple. It, it could be very fine and happy within the company. But the moment you walk in the door, you're going to set the stage for whether or not things are good or bad. And you have to understand that everyone is watching. And so yeah. that's very important. The other thing I would go back to, and you mentioned this earlier, and it ties to your comment about branding. Um it's good to be different. I think a lot of times people with regards to their services as they become experts, it's great to be best, but sooner or later, somebody can quickly out best you. The, yeah. the point is, is nobody can out different you. You, right. you are unique. And so right. lean into your uniqueness. And that's where, you know, niching becomes very valuable. That's where, where your personality, your persona, your brand becomes essential because people will be drawn to you. And you have to understand that that's very important. In fact, I'm going to add something to this. I think in business, there's this feeling sometimes that my success has to come at the at the expense of someone else's failure. I have right. to win at the at the expense of someone else losing. And I'm going to now argue that's not the case. Right. I come from an abundance mindset. My abundance says that you can be successful and I can be successful. I believe there's plenty of clients for you and plenty of clients for me. Yeah. I don't need to feel that when you get a client and are successful that I need to wallow and be frustrated because I didn't get that client. Exactly. Oh, you know what? You got that client. I'm going to get the next one. I don't mind competition. I'm all for capitalism. But the point is, is I think it's 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 toxic to believe that I have to succeed based on the failings of other people. No, right. I'm happy that everybody's successful. I believe right. there's plenty out there to go around, and I'm I'm eager for other people to be successful because I think it challenges me to become my better person. And so I do come at this with an abundance mindset and I, I help my clients recognize that they're not taking from anyone else right. for them to be successful. Doesn't mean somebody else had to suffer, lose, or, or be beaten down, just be successful and be happy. And then you're yeah. going to be good. I agree. You know, that's a great point because a lot of people feel like they have to really, you know, see someone else fail in order for them to succeed. Mm -hmm. And they have that mindset and that's a terrible mindset. That's a negative mindset. And that's it's toxic. Not, it's toxic. It's totally toxic. And, you know, everybody could have a win-win, you know, and sometimes even helping somebody have a win, you know, and, you know, pays back in, in, the, in the end because you've helped them and eventually they will come back and help you you know, and that one referral or they, or, you know, something positive they might say to another client that they have, you know, business can come back to you in that sense too. So, you know, it, it, it's better to be more, you know, positive and to be more, you know, want to help others and not want to, you know, dig a hole in the ground and try to push them in it. You know, it really, it works against you. It doesn't work for you. Most definitely. I'm glad we at least addressed that much. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now, where can people find your book? Is it out right now? It is. It's called Your Strategic Accountant. And then as a companion to that, I wrote a book called Your Profit and Growth Expert. It speaks to the advisory services someone should expect from their business coach. But both of those are each available online for free. You can go to universalaccounting.com. In the free resource section, you'll find that there are eBooks and each of them are listed there. Oh, that's amazing. I love it. Now, if you had to take what we talked about today and you wanted to emphasize on a couple of important aspects, what are those things that you'd like to emphasize on? First of all, the abundance. I'm glad we brought that up. The second would be gratitude. I think really we need to be very aware of the things that we are blessed with in our lives. I feel that people who are positive and optimistic and are able to recognize the blessings in their lives are uh, ones to draw other people to them. And so I'd like to emphasize gratitude. There's so much in my life that I'm gratitude uh, grateful for that are both personal and professional. And that I think each of us needs to spend some time just counting the blessings in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, the third thing that I would add is personal time. I think too often, at least speaking to myself, I'm a workaholic. I love yeah. what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. I enjoy what I do. And therefore I find myself oftentimes willing to work the long hours and do the, the things that really kind of pull me away from friends and family, yeah. uh, hobbies and interests that I have. And I think it's important that I go recharge. It goes back to that point of having passion. It's hard yeah. to be passionate when you're tired and beaten down. And so yeah. it's good to kind of go step away, recharge and take the vacation 
important. Spend time with friends and family. Don't let those those relationships fail. I think it's important for us to remember that no success outside of the home compensates for failure in the home. And so that's a phrase I learned years and years ago. It's a, a quote that I was told that really resonated with me. I want to be successful in, in, in all that I do, but I don't want to do it at the sacrifice of my family. And uh, really, that's important to me. So that being said, I do want to point out that success does take sacrifice. There are things that we have to prioritize. There are things that have to give. But yeah. at the end of the day, I don't want it to be at the, the the cost or loss of my family. So I do want to keep that in perspective. So definitely starting with the idea of abundance, the second being gratitude, and then the third personal time, just recognizing I'm working to live, not living to work. And I like that you mentioned that because that's so important. You know, you hear people talking about that all the time because many people, even, you know, I, I tend to, you know, you know, work very long hours, not meaning to, to do, but I get so involved in what I do and, and I have such high goals that I set for myself. Sometimes that could work against you too, because mm -hmm. then, you know, you don't want to put your, your, um, yourself in front of, you know, before your family and you want to, you know, because you can't get those memories back. You know, so, you know, the time you have right now is a time that you should try to, like you said, you know, work less and, and enjoy more and figure out a way to do that. And there's lots of ways, you know, you could learn to do that. And I think some of the cores and some of the values that you expressed today could help you do that, you know, and uh, it is, you know, and gratitude too. I think oh, so many times people tend to, you know, think about what they want, what they want, and they don't stop to think about what they have. And I've, I've learned, you know, lessons around my life. You don't really realize how important something is. It could be the littlest thing until it's taken away from you. And then you realized how important it was and how valuable it was in your life. So instead of, you know, focusing on what you don't have to focus on what you do have, and then maybe even, you know, share and have gratitude and, and express your gratitude towards others. You know, there are many times where people have talked about writing a letter, you know, a short letter to somebody and, and giving it to them and, you know, just telling them how special they are and how much they, they mean in your life, you know, and little things like that. And then even thinking about, if you go on your deck and you have a cup of coffee or if you go on your terrace and have a cup of coffee, you know, just being able to go outside, breathe the air, you know, enjoy a, a nice cup of tea or coffee, or whatever you like to drink. And you'd be able to just, you know, be grateful for what you do have, you know, and I think if you do have that positive attitude, positive things will happen in your life. It's like that positive energy. And I, I truly believe in that. It's what we put out is what we get back. So true. Yes, there is something to be said that what we are draws in more of it. And yeah. so we we have to be mindful of what we're putting out there to the universe, to the society, and we're going to get back what we put out. There's there's yeah. something to be said about that. So well, good said. Well said. Mm -hmm. Now, I, you know, I really, I, I loved having you on the show today. And I, is there anything else that you'd like to add to the comments that you've made so far and everything we've talked about today? Yes. Uh, to, all the to all the listeners, as business owners, I think we need to recognize that all the sacrifice risks that we take, we are the backbone of the economy. Whether you're in the United States, around the world, it doesn't matter. We are the ones that actually keep the economy going. And we have to understand that there are people dependent upon our growth and success. So lean into your business. What you're doing does matter. You are changing lives. Regardless of the product or service that you're offering, it is making a difference. And so I want you to understand as listeners that there is something to be said about what it is you do, because I think the people that are employed by you, their quality of life is dependent upon the income that you pay, the payroll you're offering, the customers that you're servicing, they need what you're offering simply because it's meeting a need that they have. So be grateful for the fact that you're able to employ the individuals you do and serve the clients that you have. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, um, I really appreciate you, Stacey, taking the time and providing us this venue in which we can have this conversation. There needs to be more of these types of conversations for business owners to hear that what we do matters and for those of us that are in the business coaching world so that we can more kind of get akin to what is needed out there and hear different points of view so that we can better service our clients as well. well I thank you for that. I appreciate that comment. And once again, tell everybody your website so they know where to go to find you. Universalaccounting.com. It's there that I have my podcast a number of free resources that I offer to business professionals. 
great white papers, some webinars, courses, eBooks, as I mentioned. So definitely take advantage of those free resources. But most importantly, connect with me on LinkedIn. I do a lot on LinkedIn. I love being connected to individuals. I think that's a phenomenal space for us to interact professionally. And I'd love to have those connections. So definitely reach out and connect with me there. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Roger, for coming on the show. You you actually provided a whirlwind of knowledge today and very valuable knowledge, if I may say so. And I, I thank you very much for sharing this knowledge and, and helping people so they can have different ideas and, and help grow and have the resources to reach out and use so they can, you know, expand their, their businesses and their goals and, and reach levels, you know, that will make them feel successful because everybody's success, you know, definition of success is different, but as long as we achieve it and we feel good about ourselves, that's all that matters. Well, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation. I thought we covered some great topics. And always remember the, this, is if, it's, uh, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you have a great day, Roger. Take care. You too.